All right, so now we can welcome everybody to our winter web series, The Birds of Mer Bleu. And uh, I am Sharon Boddy. I'm with the Friends of Hampton Park and the Friends of Carlington Woods. And our special guest tonight is Alex Stone. So um, for your uh, information, it will be recorded and it will be up on our YouTube channel probably by this weekend. So if you ever want to rewatch it or if you need to step out and you miss a little bit about it, it will be there. If you have any questions as you go along, just post them in the chat and we will get to as many as we can at the at the end. So I'd like to just introduce our speaker, Alex Stone. He's been with the National Cap Capital Commission now for six years as a biologist, and he's worked with us in Friends of Hampton Park for the last year. He's also previously worked as an environmental planner and an avian ecologist. So some of you who've been in Ottawa for a while may remember back in 2018, there was a killdeer nest that set up shop um, on Blues Fest at Le Breton Flats. And Alex was one of the biologists that helped to successfully move that nest. Uh, so he's gonna be talking about his knowledge of the birds of Mer Bleu, but of course, a lot of these species can be found in our neck of the woods too. So welcome, Alex. Thanks, Sharon. I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's nice to share uh, some of our stories and uh, biology with uh, the friends of Hampton and Fairlingwood Park. Um, I'm going to share my presentation, um, which is here. And there we go. Um, so, uh, thanks Sharon for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to have started working with the group. Um, we've passed a lot, a lot of good projects on the go with Japanese knotweed. So, um, this is, uh, this is my presentation of the birds of Mer Bleu. I've been visiting Mer Bleu since I was nine years old when I moved to Canada. Um, I've, uh, lived in Ottawa, uh, for, uh, many years, <laughs> a, few, a few decades now, well, three decades now, I guess, and well, two decades now, but um, uh, I've, I'm always been a field biologist. I've been very interested in species at risk. I did a lot of reading bird surveys for Bird Studies Canada, or now Birds Canada, and Environment Canada. Um, I studied at the University of Ottawa to do my master's in uh, least bitter in the National Capital Region. And I've been working at the NCC ever since then. Uh, one of my primary roles is uh, deals with wetland enhancement across the city. Um, the city is a very, very busy place, and we want to make sure that our wetlands and biodiversity in those wetlands are protected. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, the invasive species, uh, you know, that they that they don't stay here too long. That there's restoration projects in place to to remove them and rehabilitate some of those sites. Uh, we spent a lot of time recently on a road ecology project. So we've been mapping out different uh, roads and surveying them for any road mortality, things like that, and then documenting documenting those for uh, future uh, road development projects to to kind of reduce the amount of roadkill that's that's happening, especially when roads cross uh, greenbelt natural lands. Uh, a lot. I, a lot of my work is natural resource management too, so that includes biodiversity monitoring, which is what I'm mostly going to be talking about tonight. Uh, but we've also done a lot of natural disaster management with the tornadoes, windbursts, derecho, um, very, very recently. So here's some pictures of of my team in action. Um, every year we get roughly four students, and um, my colleague Patrick is on is on holding the, <laughs> the dip net, and uh, that's actually taking that mirror blow. So um, the middle picture is uh, my students uh, taking out some Japanese knotweed, putting tarpaulin over it, and uh, letting everything settle down until we replant. And then on the left, we have a colleague who's actually looking for turtles. So uh, we spend some time looking for things uh, in the water and around the water. Uh, a few of my more successful projects include road fencing, wetlands, and uh, some more replanting projects. So just uh, just a feel for, for, for what I do generally on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm here really to talk about Maribel Conservation Area. So it's, it's a very special place. Uh, the National Capital Region is really lucky to have such a large and contiguous 
uh, wetland. Um, it's primarily a, a bog, so it's one of the largest peat, peat bogs, and it's by far one of the most accessible peat bogs in, in Canada. Uh, it's also a newly recognized amparasite, site, so that's important amphibian reptile area for its biodiversity, especially with amphibians and reptiles. Um, we have many different snakes, we've got many different turtles, we've got uh, many amphibians, salamanders, frogs, things like that, that, that all inhabit that area. Uh, we have many locally rare species found. These could be um, things like orchids, uh, it could be ericaceous plants. Those are more uh, plants that occur fairly further north than, than here. And um, we get around 10,000 visitors at least a year. And it's one of the most studied uh, peat bogs in the, in the world. We have, we know there's over 180 papers that have been published uh, in Maribel itself. And it is an important carbon exchange study area. So uh, our researchers study how much carbon is being emitted by the bog and how much is being sequestered by the bog. And that's really important because we know that 30% of Canada is covered by bogs. And if we're uh, going to be studying how to uh, affect carbon balance, it's really important to understand how, how, how that works. So, like I said, it's really, really accessible. We have a 1.1 kilometer boardwalk that goes around it. Getting a little bit of feedback. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is what a, a bog looks like in general. So it's this is mostly sphagnum moss around, very reminiscent of our northern areas. And you can see black spruce and tamarack uh, all in that area. So there's very special bird communities that actually inhabit these, these areas. Um, it's, it's a very big contiguous bog. Um, it's around, um, well, the green bog itself is four times larger than uh, Rouge National Urban Park. So we manage a very, very large area. I believe Rouge can roughly fit inside Mer Bleu uh, sector and Greens Creek sector. Um, we have five parking lots in the area. We've got a lot of roads that, that circuit that go around uh, Maribel. And uh, we try to limit the amount of roads that are actually inside the, the, the wetland itself. As you can see, um, the Maribel bog itself, the Ramsar site is in green. We have, I overlaid a little bit of wetlands over top of it, and then you can see it's surrounded by agriculture as part of the NCC's equipment to cultural heritage and agriculture, maintaining a rural feel for the area and uh, more, more urban development around it. So uh, it is an imparasite. So we can see here, this is a special turtle. It's called a blanding turtle. It's the one with the yellow chin. It's quite different from the painted turtle just behind it. So you can see how flat that painted turtle is. So during our biodiversity monitoring, uh, we're especially looking for, for this turtle since it is, it is endangered and the populations are dwindling. Uh, for instance, a city of Ottawa um, did a quick study on, on these turtles and uh, they found that uh, the population crashed from around 60 individuals down to, down to 19 or 18. So um, these guys are having a lot of trouble. So uh, we're trying to locate them or protect the area. On the right, we've got a pink slipper uh, type of orchid. Uh, they used to be quite common around Mirbula. A lot of them were picked by, by people, but now they're, um, now they're protected and we don't actually uh, talk about where, where they are located within the bog itself. Some of our creatures include this American mink. Uh, you know, you never know where you're going to come across, uh, whether it's a turtle, whether it's a mammal, or whether it's a bird. Um, so it's it's home to moose, it's home to beavers, it's home to porcupines, and most of all birds. Um, it's uh, an oasis of biodiversity within the city of Ottawa, and a, and a great place to work. Here's some more photos. So you can really see that there, there's quite a diversity of uh, marsh. 
there's quite a bit that we've got, uh, we have open water, we've got creeks, streams, and it's very, very flat. Uh, here's another picture showing a bit more of the hidden areas of, of Mer Bleu. Um, these areas are, are, are not very accessible. Uh, we usually do it by canoe. When we do go in on the bottom left, especially, but that's where we find uh, some of the really neat stuff like sandhill cranes and other species that I'm going to be, be talking about. Just some more pictures, um, just to give you a real good feel of, of, of what Marble looks like. Uh, you can see there's open water, uh, there's a bit of marsh, and there's and there's logs. So really good diversity of habitats here. In the winter, um, it's a good time for, for us to access this. There's some birds that actually do nest in Ottawa during the winter. Um, these are usually finches, so white ring crossbills and red crossbills. And their beaks are their beaks are uh, not straight, so uh, they can actually use their bills to pry open the seed cones, even during winter. And this allows them to uh, access good food sources and while also um, having year-round access so uh, they can actually breed in winter unlike most of our birds that only start to return in May. So the background of, of breeding birds in, in Canada is, is quite interesting. So the state of Canada's birds came out in 2019. It was a court with Birds Canada, Environment Canada, and a whole bunch of other conservation organizations. And this shows you sort of the backdrop of how bird populations in Canada are doing. So we're seeing 150% increase in waterfowl, which is super interesting. Uh, it's because we're protecting a lot more of our wetlands. There's policies in place and there's uh, a recognition of how important these habitats are to, to biodiversity. Uh, we're seeing 110% more birds of prey. And that's the rebound effect that we're seeing from the DGT ban. Uh, in the 1970s. So we're seeing a lot more uh, birds of prey that are able to, to survive and thrive. On the other side of things, uh, we're seeing a 60% decline in aerial insectivores and 57% uh, less grassland birds. So uh, these species become uh, species at risk. They're in danger of becoming uh, extinct or extirpated in, in the region. And um, I've divided up some of the talk into talking about our rare species at risk, more common birds, and uh, Mayor Blue Box specialists around the Ottawa area. So we have about uh, 200 plus species of birds recorded in Mayor Blue. Uh, we've got uh, 19 avian species at risk that, that inhabit the area. Uh, the reason how we're able to calculate these, these uh, declines is through programs like the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. So it's a multi-generational monitoring project. It was started in 1980, and the program lasts for five years. So 1980 to 1985, 2000 to 2005, and 2020 to 2025. So we're actually just in the midst of the third Breeding Bird Atlas for Ontario. So each site's visited in 1980, it's again visited in 2000 and then again in 2020. That gives us a really good feel for how things are changing. Ontario's divvied up into basically a grid system, 10 by 10 kilometer squares across, uh, across the province. And there's dedicated volunteers who have who are responsible for their 10 by 10 kilometer square and they report on it. I'm responsible for the Mayor Blue Square. So you can see here, this is what a square looks like. Um, you have to see everything, but this gives you a good idea of sort of the land use surrounding Mer Bleu. So we have the conservation area, and then uh, adjacent to it in pink is all the agricultural land around it. And the, the gray is usually built areas. So you can see that there's very little forest connectivity to Mer Bleu and that it's surrounded by agricultural landscapes, which do permit animals to move around, but the, uh, the development around it doesn't allow animals to move through. Um, so this is, this is my, my square, my area. I was lucky enough last year to participate in Northern Ontario atlasing. So uh, it's very difficult to access Northern Ontario. 
Um, we were sent up uh, with uh, on a float plane to to canoe a part of remote northern Ontario, and it actually looks very similar to Mer Bleu. So on the top right for me, the the image of the bog there, very similar to to what Mer Bleu looks like. But I had a lot of fun, and it was a good opportunity to explore uh, more remote parts of, of Ontario. This is what Northern Ontario looks like. So um, the picture that I want to draw your attention to, especially, is the image from the from uh, the aerial image on the float plane. Uh, you can see here that there's a band of riparian greenery, which is which is forest, it's black spruce. And it's very, very green. And on the left, you can see, you can see that it just turns into a big bog. And essentially, uh, what these rivers allow the greenery uh, to survive roughly 200 meters and 200 meter either side band. And the rest is just completely bog, similar to what you see on the my far right, which is the image of um, of, of of a bog. So for tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about our species at risk. I'm going to sp speak a bit about Mirabilis specialists. I'm going to talk a bit more about common species uh, that, you can, that you can see. So to start with, I'm going to start with black tern. So black tern is a rare marshland species. Uh, it's quite striking when you see it. It's uh, black and white. This is how I usually see them. Uh, this image was taken on Barty Lake because although we have historical records in Mir Bleu, they're no longer there. Uh, their populations have crashed in the past uh, 30 years in, in Ontario especially, but they tend, they are doing well in the Western provinces. Um, this is what they, what they look like. Um, they're pretty neat creatures. They stay airborne quite a lot. Uh, they're strong flyers. Uh, very easy to see uh, when they do fly because of their black and white patterns. And what they're actually looking for is emerging insects off of the uh, off of the lakes. So um, all the all the hoverflies, all everything that's coming off of the dragonflies, everything that's coming off of the uh, lakes and rivers, they're interested in. So they're primarily insectivores. They may eat a few fish, but that's really what they're looking for. This one in here is, is, is hunting, uh, hunting over a uh, wetland. Um, this is a uh, typical view that, they, that, 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 that you can get. One of the other uh, species you can see in Mer Blue is bald eagles. Um, they're doing very, very well now in, in Ottawa. So um, they're actually becoming uh, delisted off of a species at risk, which means that efforts to restore uh, restore them back to their population size has been successful, largely through the banning of, of DDT. Uh, the um, adults take five years to reach this plumage. So this is the full bald eagle with the white head and uh, black body, but the juveniles until for about four years, they'll retain their black on their head. So uh, there's a lot of confusion between them and golden eagles but bald eagles always have a quite large bill. So um, that's the fastest way to tell them apart. Another bird that we have in, in Mare Bleu and they're reasonably common is called Canada Warbler. So it's our warbler. Um, <laughs> it's the mascot for Birds Canada. And they're really, really quite striking uh, when you do get a chance to see them. Uh, they're very, very challenging to see. Um, uh, this photo was was taken actually in a golf park, um, but they have a beautiful blue collar on their throat, a yellow underside, and uh, the yellow iring. So they're they always look startled whenever I see them. Um, this one's especially startled, but um, I, I like this picture because his wings are extended. You can see all the light coming through. Uh, so this is a Canada warbler. Um, they migrate every year to uh, parts of uh, Panama, Costa Rica, places like that. Uh, so they undertake a huge migration 
Uh, they usually sometimes even fly straight over the Gulf of Mexico to 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 get there to arrive at their destination. So it's amazing for a 18 gram or 25 gram bird to to make these huge migrations year after year. And uh, this is one of the warblers that aren't often seen, but you can hear them if you know what they sound like quite quite well. Yeah, one of my favorite birds. Um, at night, uh, these guys will come alive. So uh, this is called an eastern whippoorwill, and uh, in in you know in uh, rural Ontario, they used to be quite a common uh, thing to hear the uh, the whippoorwill uh, whistle. Maybe some of you have already heard it. Um, I'm not going to do it because I'm not sure if I'm going to blow the speakers on or not on this on this thing. But uh, they're quite <laughs> they're quite they're they're quite loud. And uh, there are some parts of Ottawa still, uh, like Blue Rose Forest, where you can still hear hundreds of them in in a night. So I think my 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 total was something like seventy one or eighty of these in in Blue Rose Forest singing in, in a beautiful June uh, evening at around eleven p.m. Um, and during the day, they like to hide. So this one's sleeping on a, on a branch. It's trying to blend it in well. Um, and they, they're, they're primarily insectivorous. These guys also migrate uh, further, further south. And um, they're really cool. Uh, one time, I even came across a nest. Uh, it was doing a broken wing display, very, very similar to a killdeer. And they actually don't really make nests. What they do is they kind of just plop their their eggs on the ground, and that's good enough for them. And they'll uh, they'll stay by the egg for for a couple of months before before they hatch. So uh, not often seen, but um, sometimes during the day you can get lucky and see them see them on a branch. Uh, this is my study species. So this is the least bitter. And Ottawa is at the northernmost edge of its range. So they follow the Ottawa River and they don't really go any further north than, than the National Capital Region. Um, I found between, there's around seven to 18 pairs of these guys in Greenbelt. Um, we have a few pairs in, in Maribula and they're very, very tricky to find. That said, uh, I do have some really cool pictures that I'm actually kind of excited to show you. So here's a close up of what they look like. Um, they actually never really touched the ground. They work their way through reeds and cattails using their using their legs. They kind of just grab on like this, and they grab on like this, and they kind of work their way throughout the uh, throughout the cattail. Um, very cool species. Um, they do migrate. Uh, they're only here from May to August, September. And they're, they eat fish, amphibians, and insects. Um, and this is what their neck looks like. So <laughs> I was quite amazed. Uh, my students took this photo actually in Mayor Blue. This is, this is in a tamarack tree. And uh, you can see how long the neck extends. And uh, they're quite small. Um, they're probably, you can't see me on the screen, but I'm showing you they're roughly uh, two, maybe 20, 20 inches total. Um, they're quite small birds, but uh, they're quite loud. You will hear them if you're, if you're looking out for them. And um, yeah, this one's, this one's in a tree. It's the first time I've ever seen one in a tree. Uh, usually they're, they're more often found in, in this kind of habitat uh, moving through. So they're threatened in, in Ontario. Um, we're at sort of the northern limit of their range. Uh, and one of their primary threats is getting hit by cars, so car collisions. So this guy was found uh, on one of the roads in the green belt, and we found five or six of them now. So unfortunately, uh, when they're, they're most active during um, the early hours of the morning, and that tends to be when rush hour is. So with added traffic volumes, you're gonna see higher incidences of road mortality. So uh, we only have you know, 18, 19 pairs. And so anyone that does get hit by, by a car is, uh, is unfortunate. Um, so evening gross weeks are, are really neat. 
Uh, they frequent the boreal forest in uh, northern northern Ontario, and they do come down to Ottawa. This is sort of their southern limit. So um, Ottawa is interesting. Uh, it's got some northern uh, habitats like Mirabla. It's got some southern habitats um, similar to what you would see in in the states, or not quite Carolinian, but but almost Carolinian. So uh, we have sort of yellow-billed cuckoos, things like that. We also got our northern visitors, which include the Rosebills. So right now there is a flock of these guys at the Jewberry Trail feeders in Mirabeau. Um, I've seen them there quite regularly. And if you just drive to that parking lot, the feeder is right at the parking lot and you'll be able to see them from your car. Um, they've got this beautiful yellow crown um, black wing tips, uh, white white feathers on on, on the wing, and uh, I think they're really cool. They're um, they do well in good seed crop years. So trees cycle their seed crops. So one year might not be good, but the second year might be better. So these guys are always in search of good seed crops across North America. So a flock could be in Newfoundland one year looking for a good seed crop, could be in the Yukon the next year. So they're very cyclical, and it's very hard to get an idea of their population as a result of this, of, of, of their cyclical nature. Um, there's also a lot of pests up north, like spruce budworm, and uh, whenever they, they explode, these guys do very well because they're able to eat uh, those insects. So this is a male that I found uh, it, at Jupiter Trail last year. They're, they're here this year, so I encourage everyone to, uh, to go take a look at them. They're species of special concern, um, partially because we don't know enough about uh, their movements because they are quite, quite widespread. Uh, another bird that we have is the wood thrush, and they really need contiguous forest ecosystems to survive. They don't do well in edge habitats. I think there are a couple maybe in, in Carlington Woods and Hampton Woods, but uh, they don't like edge habitats. They like to be deep in the forest. So I mostly see them in Shirley's Bay and Mare Bleu. They have a beautiful food-like quality and uh, they're, they're considered threatened because they, they really need those large forests to, to survive. Here's another picture. So they've got a really, really bold uh, black pattern on their, on their belly. And uh, compared to our hermit thrush, they have, hermit thrushes have two tones. They have a rusty tail and brown. You don't really see it here, but this bird is mostly brown with, with, with white black spots. So uh, I'm sure everyone here has probably seen the red and blackbird, but sometimes we get other species of, of rusty blackbirds, uh, other species of blackbirds. This one's called a rusty blackbird. And there's two reasons why it could be called rusty. One is the fact that it's got, it looks brownish, looks like a rusty color, or it could be that its call sounds like a rusty gate opening. So there's two different, uh, <laughs> there's two different sounds that they may have, uh, two different ways that they may be called rusty. Uh, these guys are considered to be threatened and they live in bogs, much like Mare Blue. And we're not, exactly sure what's what's driving their declines but in winter they do forage with red and blackbirds and those are considered to be pests by many farmers so they do get hit by pest control in uh, in other countries for their further south um it's nice trans nice moving from a bog specialist into sort of the marital specialists because most of the marabou specialists uh, come from the fact that um, it's a large contiguous bog. It's one of the, well, it's the largest accessible bog, especially for people in the region. And so sometimes we get to see really neat birds that show up here. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Northern Hawk Owl. And this is my typical view of a Hawk Owl. <laughs> um, they're very sought after by, by photographers. Uh, this is one that I found up up north. Um, they really like uh, bogs or fire habitats. So um, uh, fire is a natural part of northern Ontario and also our region here. Um, we don't have, uh, we suppress a lot of fires, especially in urban areas. 
and uh, northern areas, it's sort of a more natural site. There's not much uh, development up there, so there, the forest fires uh, can can happen, and uh, they can they can reach swaths of land probably um, you know uh, hundreds if not thousands of hectares wide. And this gives a chance for the these hot owls to thrive in that in that area. And uh, this is what they what they look like. This is the better picture of them. So um, I think it's really important to show sometimes we have bad photos of them where the birds in in, in bad light and it really brings out uh, the, the good moments where we see them in, in, in full light. So uh, this hawk owl was taken, well, I took this photo in Ottawa um, two years ago or last year and um, turned out really, really well. They are quite tame although they do get stressed if photographers are nearby. So we make sure that, or try to ensure that uh, their locations remain quiet and that people are respectful when taking photos of them. But this guy is very, very photogenic. And it's really nice to share some, some of the, their stories. Um, hawk owls are, uh, there was one breeder, uh, one known breeding record in Ottawa, and that is in Merbleu during the 1970s. 1980s and it hasn't returned since. So I'm always hopeful whenever I'm going out there that I might find a hawk owl. Um, but so far it, it hasn't happened uh, in, in Maribla. They do overwinter sometimes here, but it's hard to find them breeding. Sandhill cranes are another species that inhabit uh, the box. So when I was up north, I took this photo of two sandhill cranes. Um, two years ago, I found a colt, so that's uh, a young, a young, a young crane. Uh, so I confirmed that they are nesting in Merbleu, and that they have a really good, uh, really good population. Um, partially because the bog habitat is per perfect for them to breed in, and the uh, agricultural fields around them provide a good source of corn and food for them to eat. So it's they found sort of the perfect site for 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 them to to survive. Um, they're really quite distinctive when they do call. You can hear their hear their call for kilometers away, and they do pair up quite. They do pair up uh, for um, at least for the summer, if not for for life. So they're they're quite cool. They have a lot of fortune displays. They do a lot of dances together, and uh, they're generally a joy to watch. So this is one in action. Um, it's calling to the mate, saying, "Hey, I think there's a predator around," which would be me. So uh, <laughs> they're quite they're they're quite neat. They have red heads, and they're they're brown underneath, which helps them. Um, escape notice whenever they're incubating their, their eggs. So um, you might get lucky. There's a couple of fields around around Mirror Blue where they do, uh, they can be seen quite well, um, but usually it's, they're, they're quite far away, but I think they're really, really cool. This is just one of our specialists. Uh, one of the neat things about being near a bog is that uh, we have, uh, a special warbler called the palm warbler. These generally uh, breed further up north. So there's uh, some breeding populations north of Algonquin in La Vendry, but there is a local breeding population in Ottawa. Um, I estimate the population between 75 and 125 breeding pairs. And um, we're quite lucky in Ottawa because we have the yellow subspecies of palm warbler. As you, this is the westernmost population of eastern palm warblers in Canada occur in Ottawa. So uh, basically from Ottawa east to New Brunswick, we'll see yellow palm warblers. And then anywhere west or north of, of this area, we'll see the drabber brown uh, palm warbler. So you can see, this guy isn't as pretty looking. He's he's quite drab. Um, still has that russet cap on his on his head, and these guys flick their tails quite quite regularly. So they're quite easy to identify uh, once you see them flicking flicking their tails. 
And then here's sort of the side by side comparison of all the yellow on it's it's on my right, but you can see it's it, it's much brighter than the, the western or brown uh, palm oil flare from the left. Uh, this is one of my favorite species. It's a Lincoln sparrow. Um, there is a unique population again in Mirabeau. They like black spruce. They like sphagnum moss. Um, I usually find their nests in in the moss itself. So as they uh, they'll actually nest in uh, over, the moss will overhang and then they'll find a little crevice underneath and they'll be nesting in that crevice. Um, they're a little different from our song sparrows, swamp sparrows, and savanna sparrows. Those are our sort of our more common, common sparrows. And this picture kind of shows it to me because it has buffy yellow on the sides. They have a grayish head and they have a small bill. Um, when you get into birding, you'll see uh, minor differences make a big difference. And so um, I, I think they're really cool. I like hearing them, especially. Uh, Algonquin's uh, probably the, the, one of the sites between Algonquin and Alfred are, are, are the, the three nearest populations in Maribola for purple finch sparrow. Um, last but not least is the purple finch. So uh, these are uh, um, these are pretty tame finches. They do quite well in urban environments when the sunflower seeds are available and people's eaters. Um, but they also like uh, bogs. And I think one day I saw a flock of around 300 purple finches in, uh, in the green belt, which was, which was amazing to, to see and hear. Um, the males are stunning. Um, they've got beautiful maroon on, on them. So hopefully you'll be able to see them when you come out, when even in the city, they do come to theaters. But we see them naturally enjoying some of the pine cones on the black spruce and tamarack that occur in, in their blue. So um, these are sort of our specialists. So a lot of birders talk to Mary Blue to see these birds. Um, the, the record for most birds seen in the Ottawa region is 262 species in one year. So that's around uh, 50 to 60% of the birds in, in North America. So uh, we live along um, a major flyway, which is the Ottawa River. We uh, have three or four special habitats, including our northern habitats at Mer Bleu, and our southern hab habitats further south along the Jock River, um, sort of closer to Thomas Dolan, um, there, there's some very uh, southern looking habitats. So we're right at the cusp and uh, we're sort of between the shield and uh, between the St. Lawrence Lowland region, which includes Montreal and Ottawa Corridor along the Ottawa River and, and St. Lawrence River. Uh, so some more common species that you may see, um, red-winged blackbirds, uh, quite common and quite beautiful. Uh, I hope everyone has has seen one. Um, coming from you know other countries like like England, things like that, they don't have as bright birds as as we do. Uh, they've they've been known to attack people as they walk by their their nests. <laughs> I see Sharon nodding her head <laughs> twice, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, they, they dive bomb people. They're trying to tell you, you know, get away from my nest. Um, but I don't think they'll actually hurt you. Hopefully not. Hopefully you didn't get packed too much. But um, they're, uh, they're neat. They have a lot of displays. And um, they're largely communal nesters. So um, it'll have large colonies in, uh, in, in, in a site, uh, the females Kind of, kind of move around quite a lot, and the males do do hold a bit of territory, but uh, they're, yeah, they're quite communal in nature. They're neat birds. Um, one bird that you may not see as as regularly is the common yellow throat. Um, this is actually a female, and um, they're 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 quite common, but you don't often get to see them. So the males have a black mask. Up around their eye. Uh, in France, they're called Paris Masque uh, because of that mask. And um, 
they're they're frequently in bushes. They're they're around, but unless you're a, a birder or you you really pay attention to birds, you probably won't see them. Another common warbler is our yellow warbler, our paladin joan. Um, they're they're quite common uh, everywhere in Ottawa. Uh, Hampton Park, Carlington Park, all all, all have these uh, all have these air, uh, little birds. Um, they like hanging out near water, um, and the males have these really nice orange streaks on their on their belly, which is quite quite awesome um, when you do get a close look at them. Another one of our warblers is called the chestnut sided warbler. Um, these guys are actually very very similar to yellow warblers, genet genetically speaking. Uh, they only diverged a few thousand years ago. So in relative terms, that's that's not a lot of time. So um, they have similar calls, they have similar DNA. Um, but as you can see, the chestnut side warbler looks very, very different than, than the yellow warbler. It's got chestnut on the flanks. It's got a, it's got you know black and white markings on on the wings, and they have this kind of olive green back right to their head. So um, this is one of the common warblers. You should be able to see them at Hampton and Carlington Woods, um, but um, it always helps to have have a guide with you. Um, there are a number of good guides around Ottawa. Um, Tony Beck is one, John Reddy is another, uh, they do excellent, excellent tours. Um, if you want to find out more about, about birds, they're, they're, they're really good people as well. I'm, as well, I'm happy to <laughs> talk birds with, with anyone, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, so um, going back to uh, data and, and things like that, there's a really neat um, application called eBird, and it allows me to actually check in and see how many birds are being seen across the different parks. So for Hampton Park, uh, as of two days ago, there was 107 species that have been seen there, and there's been 448 checklists. And this is public accessible data. Um, it's really neat for me to me, me to see what people are, are, are submitting, what people are seeing um, in, the, in these areas. We do check them for species at risk observations uh, on a yearly basis. And um, yeah, so we have a lot of requests from Air Blue. We have less in, less in Ottawa, but um, I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention eBird. If you're interested in, in finding out more about birds, there's uh, the Merlin application. And that's a free source. It'll tell you, it'll even analyze the bird song. So if you hold your phone up, uh, you can actually just listen. It'll actually tell you which birds are calling, which is kind of kind of neat to see how technology's progressed. Um, other applications are uh, iNaturalist, Seek, Batwatch, Mission Monarch to, to submit all your monarch sightings. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of what I'm driving at is to is to make sure that you know not only are we talking about biodiversity, but we're also talking about uh, conservation and action, even at a community science and science level. So thank you all for for listening to me. Thanks, Alex. I've got at least one question in the chat and I've got a few myself. So if anybody else has other questions, pop them in there and we'll get to them. So the first one I've got is, have you seen any of the invasive uh, Phragmites in the bog? And if you have, what are you doing about it? <laughs> <laughs> for, sure. for sure. So um, there's, there's two parts to the question. Um, the first one is that uh, in the bog itself, there is actually a native species of Phragmites that isn't invasive. So we actually do have um, these native non-invasive Phragmites where we're only seeing three or four plants in, in, in an area. So it actually hasn't taken, taken it over yet. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> um, so in the bog itself, uh, we're quite lucky just to not see Phragmites. Um, that being said, um, places like Stony Swamp in the Greenbelt, that's where we're seeing uh, more Phragmites. Although um, through our 
uh, wetland rehabilitation uh, projects, we actually have removed uh, actually uh, a number of hectares of fragmented bees from, from those wetlands. Okay. So um, so far so good with the um, with the fragmented Another uh, point is that cattail are 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 invasive, although some of them are native. Mm -hmm. um, they are taking over more and more of the wetlands in, in Maribel over time as our biomass permits. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just something that we're seeing and, and you know, we may see uh, more, more biomass and less water uh, over time. Are those the cattails that are also, I mean, there's cattails in Hampton Park, in a portion of Hampton Park, the ones with the sort of, you know, the brown, same ones, they're, they're not native? Um, there, there's differing thoughts on this. Uh, they are, they are, they are invasive and they can't take over a site. Okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've noticed them actually decreasing in Hampton and other plants taking over instead. So it's weird. I don't know. Um, yeah. How many bird species overwinter uh, at the bog? So what's the difference between migratory and, and who, who stays and who goes? Yeah, so um, most of our insectivores go. Um, insectivore, there's no insects during the winter, uh, so they're mostly gone. Uh, during the winter, we mostly see our, our winter finches. Um, those are evening grosbeaks, beaks, purple finches, gold finches, uh, black cap chickadees, uh, cardinals over winter. And so we're seeing a lot of the seed eaters over winter. We're seeing the raptors that eat the seed eaters are, 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 are overwintering. Um, well, certainly over winter. Um, so on, on average, I would say you could probably see on a good day, you could probably see 12 to 20 species of bird in in uh, in and around uh Maribula during during winter. Obviously the woodpeckers are around, blue jays are around, but most of our uh, water birds are gone because of the ice. Uh, they can't really feed. So I would say around 30 to 40 species over winter. Um eBird actually has a really, really good function where you can actually select exactly what time frame you want to see and which birds are most likely present during that time. So in, in for the month of December, I we can just input say, I just want to see birds in December and we'll see it. So um, that those are the birds that are resident in Ottawa. Now, if we're talking about birds that are coming down from the, from the tundra from, from, from the north, uh, mm -hmm. Some of them do overwinter in 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 Maribula, not many of them. So things like rough-legged hawks, uh, snowy owls, northern shrikes. These are all guys that come down uh, from the northern tundra and, and tree line. Mm -hmm. uh, American tree sparrows, dark-eyed juncos. They're they're another one. So uh, we do get to see these birds in winter as they um, as they come further south, which is which is neat and nice to see some changes. Well, that's good. You mentioned northern strikes because uh, Max had a question. Uh, he had seen northern strikes several times in winter over the past few years. And is that unusual? And is it possible they could be breeding in Maribel? Or are they just coming in from, from the north? So there are northern tree line species. Uh, even where I was in, in, in northern Ontario, I was about uh, 150, 200 kilometers north of um, North of uh, Hearst, I guess, is, is is a good way of putting it, and uh, they don't even breed there, so they're closer to James Bay. They're on the tundra. I've seen them breeding in, in the Yukon Territory, and Northwest Territories, um, but they unfortunately they don't breed in Maribel. It'd be really nice to have another bird breeding there, but um, they are they are northern species. They tend to feed on. Um, Things like mice, uh, they do well in fields where there's mice, where there's uh, good amounts of sparrows. Um, they do store their food and catch their food. Uh, Northern shrikes are, are neat, but there's also the loggerhead shrike and they're an endangered species and they're mostly found in Kingston and Napanee area. And uh, they're here in summer. So you see uh, Northern shrikes here in winter and then you'll see uh, loggerhead shrikes there. They're there in the summer. So Ontario is lucky we do get to see two species of shrikes, um, but northern shrikes are really deep breeding here right now. Uh, 
And they're they're uncommon, but they're frequently seen. This year's been a down year for shrikes, I think. Not many people have, have seen them this year. I haven't actually seen one this year yet. So I'm hoping to see one later in February, March. All right. Um, and I think we missed the the, the other uh, bird watching guide. Uh, we had Tony Beck and what's with what was the other one? John Ruddy. Don John Ruddy. John Ruddy. Yeah. John Ruddy. Maybe you could just if you could type that into the chat for for somebody, Alex. If you could just pop that name in there and while I read the next one. Okay, so um, next question is, does the NCC monitor citizen science programs or should we be forwarding rare sightings directly? Uh, we saw a frigid bumblebee in late April 2022, which was confirmed by an expert on bumblebee watch and is apparently uncommon in Ottawa, as an, as an example. Uh, so should they be so, forwarding those sightings directly or or just, you know, you said you do monitor eBird, um, you know, and you download that information, but. Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, all the apps that I, sh that I, sh uh, sh that I, that I sh showed on the last slide uh, was, uh, were all apps that we monitor uh, data from. So we're able to download the data from that uh, central database. And we do that on a rotating basis every year. So it's best to upload it to these public databases. They're, they're maintained mm -hmm. um, rather than sending it to me. But uh, that's a cool observation about the bee, uh, bee stuff. Yeah. Here's a question. Um, what exactly is the difference between a bog and a marsh? It's not about that's birds, a, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a really, really good question. And I'm going to use one of my slides actually yeah. to to help show it. Um, like I think I know, but I I would rather you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, let's share screen. So um, this is a marsh uh, marsh area, um, lots of cattail, and um, they're dominant. Anyway, um, so bogs are generally dominated by sphagnum moss. Um, I get a chance. Um, here it's kind of shown, but I wanted to go over to make sure. That, uh, There we go. So the top right, um, top right image with the boardwalk. So the boardwalk actually uh, starts uh, crossing over a marsh. So this is dominated by cattail. It's actually uh, fed from from a, a moving creek. So there's moving water here. As you move further north from the marsh, there's actually uh, sphagnum moss. So it's a bog is actually a very acidic. It's challenging for plants to survive in. Um, most of the plants have waxy, waxy layers, and the pH is uh, it, it is uh, it's it's, it's quite neutral in in marshes, and maybe instead of slightly basic, versus in a in, in a sphagnum bog, which the, the moss can be accumulates over time. So it could be around ten feet of ten feet of accumulated biomass that's that's floating on top of the the water water. And then, um, yeah, so that's okay. that's really what a bog is. It's, it's dominated by the vegetation and versus the marshes, more cattail and uh, fed from uh, peeps and peppers and lakes. Okay, thank you. I've certainly noticed an increase in raptors. Maybe it's just because I've been noticing birds more, but um, I, I've been putting it down to the sheer number of rats and mice that we've upended because of all the construction in Ottawa. <laughs> and I love the fact, um, you know, Carlington has always had a very good population of ravens, but we now have them closer to Hampton Park and they're nest nesting in the hydro towers now. Um, and I love what, looking at some of the older bird books that always say, oh, ravens don't come into the city. Ravens aren't city birds. And it's like, no, they are now. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the first breeding bird atlas, they found one pair of breeding ravens. And now this breeding bird atlas is over 80 pairs of breeding, breeding ravens in Ottawa. So it's wow. amazing. 
population grow so yeah. much. Okay, we've got a couple more questions too. Um, somebody's asking, as more and more people enjoy the NCC forests and the natural areas, is there a concern about the use of bright uh, lights at night in terms of nocturnal birds or other wildlife at night? Has there been an increase in that or are people sneaking in? And um, I haven't seen an increase in 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 bright lights um, by, by, by users and, or by visitors in general. Um, most of uh, most of our visitors depart when it starts getting dark. Um, so um, during COVID, we certainly saw a, a large increase in the number of visitors to to the green belt, and that's uh, stayed relatively stable at those those higher levels of, of visitation. Um, we have a, a dark sky policy and illumination policy across the uh, green belt and a national capital region. So all all lights must have cut off, uh, full cut off, so they can't shine lights up, up into the sky. Uh, um, so that would cause more light pollution, would actually cause birds to be distracted and, uh, and attracted to the light. So um, NCC buildings uh, have, have these policies laid over top in their building codes, things like that. So uh, full cut off lighting is, is, is sort of mandatory across the National Capital Region, which helps uh, reduce light pollution. Okay. And what about canoeing in Mare Blue? You had mentioned, uh, can anybody do that, or is it just for researchers to be able to sneak, to get in there? Yeah, just just for researchers. Yeah. I don't recommend canoeing um, <laughs> in, in Mare Blue. It's very boggy. <laughs> There's a lot of beaver dams that stop you from actually doing that for any length of time. So usually I hop over 11 or 12 beaver dams. <laughs> uh, versus if you go to Petrie Island, for instance, or, or Rideau Canal, you can have a much better time canoeing than you can in, in Maribola, that's for sure. It would be an interesting thing, though, if, if we could, you know, if maybe the NCC at one point might be able to open up for small, you know, uh, maybe a small contingent of the public to go canoeing in with, obviously, you at the helm making sure that we don't do anything wrong <laughs> uh, a little a little doubtful but um well, the, board, the boardwalk actually gives a good That's showing of, of, what, of what's around so um that least bitter in picture for instance that was taken right from the boardwalk itself so um it's 1.1 kilometer loop which is uh three times bigger than alfred's alfred's loop of only 300 meters mm -hmm. uh that said they're 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 not they haven't been funded uh, either federally or provincially before this but um we have a really really nice boardwalk and it's it's quite well maintained. okay you'd mentioned at the beginning that there's a feeder at one of the parking lots and somebody's asking if feeding by hand is discouraged or encouraged when you're there so it's very nuanced um at Mud Lake right now, uh, we're having uh, problems with visitors that are hand feeding raccoons, um, hand feeding squirrels, uh, and hand feeding turkeys. Now, turkeys are large and uh, they can become quite aggressive on the path. So, uh, we have a lot of photo documentation of, of people uh, feeding the turkeys by hand. And then we also get a lot of complaints saying that the turkeys are being aggressive. So for things like turkeys and raccoons, definitely not encouraged to feed them, to feed them by, by hand. That said, I, I still don't have, um, you know, things like chickadees uh, and things like that. It's, def it's not encouraged, but it's also not discouraged uh, compared to things like feeding uh, ducks, geese, turkeys, deer, raccoons, squirrels, chipmunks. <laughs> All, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And another question. Um, you mentioned that the owl sightings are not advertised in order to protect uh, the bird. Um, we, you know, unfortunately, there have been a lot of people who do that at close range at Mud Lake. Um, so because they're so easily spotted, everybody knows where they are. What's your sort of opinion on that, the sort of bird tourism almost? Yeah, so it's certainly becoming more and more a problem, especially with instant messaging apps and things like that. So people have the networks of people, and um, they will they will they will notify people to come by and uh, and take photos of of owls. We usually stand by best practices. So the best practices for owls is to uh, stay to me, stay as far away as possible from the owl. Enjoy the owl. Take take your photo. Be there for two minutes. Don't approach 
uh, donor procyl, you know, 10 meters is, 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 is close enough and uh, depart after two to five minutes because the owl is not going to move. So your photo is not going to get any better. Um, so I don't understand why people are camping in, in, in front of the owl. Um, but if, if people are um, not exhibiting best practices and the owls are getting stressed, um, we do monitor um, the crowds and, 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 and you know, make sure that they're not cutting down any vegetation to take better photos of it. And, and things like that. So we are aware of, of most owls in the Greenbelt. Uh, recently, we closed down one of the parks on uh, Island Park Drive. There was um, some, uh, you know, uh, some owl sightings there, and uh, the owls were becoming visibly distressed. So we ended up having to close down uh, half the park uh, to make sure that oh, the okay. owls were protected. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I know with uh, our social media, we try, we don't post the, you know, like, you know, an owl photo on the day of sighting. We certainly don't tell people where it necessarily is. Um, you know, it's just like, here, here's an owl. It could be anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it for the questions. And we are bang on 831. So we went over by a whole minute. Um, but I'm going to stop recording now because I think that's it for questions.